celebrating 40 seasons on the air. Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, one Mississippi farmer is growing a field of superfood. We're talking turmeric to find out what it is, how it's grown, and how incorporating it into your diet can make a big difference. Everyone knows about counting calories to stay healthy, but with everything you eat in a given day, it can get pretty overwhelming. We've got some tips to help make sure that new diet doesn't go bust. Has the lack of pretty flowers got you feeling the winter blues? Don't fret, we'll show you some plants that'll add some color even when the mercury keeps dropping. And how does your garden grow? Meet a master gardener whose years in the dirt has taught and inspired countless green thumbs. Farm Week starts right now. everyone. I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Troy Mulling. Thanks for joining us today here on Farm Week. Busy show. Lots to get into. And Leighton, we'll start off by talking about something that broke shortly after we recorded last week's show. That's right. It took some time, but President Donald Trump has named his new Secretary of Agriculture. It's a familiar name to many in the South. Former Georgia Governor Sonny Perdue has been tagged to lead the U.S. Department of Agriculture. If he is confirmed, Purdue will be the first Ag Secretary from a southern state since Mike Espy of Mississippi almost 25 years ago. Purdue will oversee more than 100,000 employees that work in every facet of the country's food supply chain. He'll also help in implementing the 2019 Farm Bill. What if you could eat something that is not only healthy, but can also make you feel better? Well, studies have shown that eating turmeric can do just that. We traveled to one farm that's helping introduce the crop to a whole new audience. It may not look like much right now, but this field is home to a crop that could soon revolutionize the food and health care industry. It's called turmeric. You may not have heard of it, but it isn't anything new. In fact, some countries have been raising the root for centuries. I think this is probably one that you would see out of Asia as a spice. This is probably something that you have seen in Indian foods or in Thai foods. Now it's making its way to the United States. At Old Brook Organics in Brookhaven, Mississippi, farmer Jesse Bowie is getting in on the ground floor of what he thinks will be the next big trend. If you look at the literature, it's the new thing. And because of the nutritional value of it, people just put it, they'll just sprinkle it on whatever they are doing. But a lot of people do specific things. They make teas out of it. They put it on salads and things like that. Uh, but I think all this is driven by the fact that many people now are getting away from wanting to take a lot of medication. Studies on turmeric have shown its use can help high cholesterol, arthritis, and a multitude of other ailments. There are probably a few decades of research that show its anti-tumor properties and um, uh, many of the other medicinal properties that it has. And I think maybe culturally in the United States we're just catching up with it, whereas a lot of other cultures have used it for many hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. Bowie got his first turmeric seeds from California, an idea that turned a few heads at the time. I decided to grow it because they told me I couldn't grow it. They immediately said, you cannot grow it in Mississippi because it takes nine months to grow. And therefore, we plant in March, and normally about by September or October, you're going to have a frost. Well, whenever you have a frost, that's the end of the ball game. But for the last two years, as you know, we've, we've had a long season, and, and we've been very successful with, with the crops. Now he's preparing for spring planting with the hope that 2017 will see the biggest turmeric boom yet. Going forward, what we're going to do, we have it in a high tunnel. And what the high tunnel does is enables us to extend our growing season. So when November, December comes, uh, if a frost hits, it won't destroy our plants. And so we just... Uh... 
Jesse tells us he sells his turmeric to the fresh market just outside Jackson. You can also check out his farmer's website at the bottom of your screen for more information. The amount of calories a person needs on a daily basis can differ depending on many factors. In this week's episode of The Food Factor, MSU Extension's Natasha Haynes tells us how to keep the count under control and not bust that new healthy diet. Okay, I'm at 2,100 calories. I got to play my cards right. One more card. Hit me. Oh, two chocolate covered donuts with sprinkles. 825 calories. You busted again. <laughs> Did this ever happen to you? It's a new year and you have a new daily calorie goal. And then all of a sudden, with one poor decision, you blow it. Well, this year, let's beat the calorie dealer. Oh, you want to go again? Bring it. Okay, here comes breakfast. Sunrise apple apricot smoothie. 270 calories. Hit me. Ooh, low fat raisin nut granola bar. 140 calories. Hit me. For lunch? It's citrus glazed salmon, 510 calories. Hit me. Ha, joker card, but it's just an apple, 95 calories. And those keep the doctor away. Hit me. All right, here comes dinner. Stuffed turkey rolls with steamed veggies, 600 calories. How about dessert? Hit me. Oh, here it comes, bam. Ah, berries with frozen yogurt, 285 calories. I know what to do. How about a midnight snack? I'm done. All right. Chocolate chip cheesecake, 1,100 calories. No! Winner, winner, healthy dinner. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. Are you missing those pretty flower arrangements inside your house now that we're smack dab in the middle of winter? Well, in this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman shows us that there are still beautiful things in our Mississippi gardens. Most home gardeners will cut summer flowers for indoor vases. But what do we do in the bleak winter months? Come on, let's go out and collect some beautiful things from our Mississippi winter garden. I'm first going to collect some southern magnolia foliage. The large glossy green leaves will add coarse texture. Next I'm going to clip some crepe myrtle stems having a few faded seed pods that will add interest to our winter piece. Any arrangement wouldn't be complete without some seed heads from ornamental grasses. These will add delicate texture. I think a few branches from these junipers are perfect to add a touch of cool blue. And let's get some beautiful orange-red pyracantha fruit clusters to add some bright color. I'm going to put this winter arrangement together using the thriller, filler, and spiller technique. First, the ornamental grass and juniper cuttings will be my thrillers, adding height and excitement. Next, I'm going to fill the body with coarse texture using the southern magnolia leaves. Let's add the pyracantha stems as the spiller with the berries tumbling over the edge. And for a touch of flair, a few crepe myrtle stems. Now, all put together, voila! What do you think? Not bad, huh? So if you're interested in learning more about using beautiful things from Mississippi Gardens, contact the Coastal Research and Extension Center for more information on upcoming classes and workshops. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. Always beautiful things to be found no matter the season, huh? That is correct, and we've got some real beauties in our market segment today. President Trump moves quickly on the international trade front. Also ahead in the markets, pork production ends 2016 with a bang. Cotton faces an acreage battle with soybeans, while timber has one bright spot starting the new year off. 
President Trump signed an executive order January 23rd withdrawing the United States from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. U.S. meat industry groups pushed hard to get Congress to pass TPP both before and after the November election without success. Farm Bureau also supported the deal and now wants some type of replacement to access the Asia-Pacific markets. On the other side, the Nationals Farmers Union says it is pleased to see the end of TPP. Well, the National Pork Producers Council was also disappointed with the U.S. withdrawal from TPP. In the meantime, the hog market itself is now through its peak demand season at Christmas. It may now go sideways. I wonder if we trade sideways to maybe higher, because if you look down further down the pipeline in hogs, while weights have gotten bigger up front, um, and, and that kind of shows a little bit of a backlog there, um, but further down the, the pipeline, you do see supply starting to soften a little bit. So there's reasons to be somewhat optimistic for hogs. I don't think we're going to see new lo lows in hogs, but we could spend some, tri some time trading this range that we just carved out. Tom Vilsack moves to the USDEC come February 1st. The former Agriculture Secretary in the Obama administration will be working to grow the global market for U.S. dairy products. His title at the U.S. Dairy Export Council is President and CEO. He will also serve as that organization's primary spokesperson. Well, we take a break for our trivia quiz this week. The term droops is a botanical classification and our question is, we're asking which one of the following is classified under droops? Is the answer A, pecans, B, chestnuts, C, soybeans, or D, peanuts? We'll have that answer coming up for you here. We're going to pause for a short break, but still ahead, Leighton talks with Extension Professor James Henderson about why the timber market is surging. And in today's feature, Meet the Master. Master Gardener, that is. We'll introduce you to a woman who has been using her gifts as a gardener to teach and inspire others for years. Hear how she got started and everything she's learned. Stay with us. You know what, Daddy? I think these may be the best tomatoes we've ever grown. I think you're right. Hey, I bet we sell all of them before lunch. Man, look at that. Let me get four boxes. So, how was everything? Did you enjoy those stuffed tomatoes? It's delicious. Are these locally grown? Yep, I picked them up at the farmer's market this morning. Are you friends with Farm Week on Facebook? If not, you're missing out. Here at Farm Week, we want to hear from you. Got a question about agriculture? Our experts can help. Have a picture you want to share? Well, we'd love to see it. And there's even a chance it could show up on a future episode. So like us today and join in on the conversation. Now, it's the time when we shine the light on the families, farmers, and leaders that make Mississippi State University Extension one of the nation's best. Here's your Extension Spotlight. The 44th Annual Delta Ag Expo just wrapped up in Cleveland, Mississippi. The Expo provides farmers and others interested in agriculture an opportunity to see the latest technology and agricultural products, services, and information. Attendees had a chance to talk with extension personnel, ag-related businesses, and see the latest technology all under one roof. Some of the highlights included seminars on drones and agriculture, crop trends, and maximizing farm profits. Over 100 commercial exhibits were represented that showcased every phase of agriculture and demonstrated innovative production practices. If you have an event to tell us about, let us know, and you may see it on our next Extension Spotlight. The cotton market is being described as fairly volatile so far this month. Analyst Brian Roach is calling for a pretty solid trend higher. However, he does anticipate a fight for acres between cotton and soybeans leading up to planting time. I think that cotton acres will probably increase this year. And so you have to be as a cotton producer and looking at how you can maybe take some risk off the table. But uh, the net long in cotton is, is, is kind of wound up already. And we've probably already traded that number. So we could see some downside, but I think they're going to have to hold uh, some value against beans okay. as we head on into springtime. 
As of Wednesday afternoon at the market close, March cotton settled at 73.57. Turning now to forest products on Farm Week, strong demand is really fueling one sector of our timber market entering 2017. Extension professor James Henderson explains. Well, what's the bright spot as far as this year as we begin in timber and forestry? Hardwood saw timber. This has been a great uh, couple years actually to consider a harvest of hardwood saw timber. Uh, the prices are way above the historical average. Even in the southern United States, amongst the 13 states, we are well above average. Our, our prices right now are trending about $8 higher than the, uh, the southern average. So really great market for hardwood saw timber. And you were telling me the needs of the oil and gas industry are part of the reason that's being driven higher. Yeah, that started with the um, boom in hydraulic fracking. And as prices for oil approached $100 a barrel over the span of a few years, we saw hardwood saw timber prices reflecting demand mm -hmm. rise correspondingly. And then crude oil prices fell 2014 into 2015. And we saw a little dip in hardwood saw timber prices, but then it picked back up again. And we attribute that to continued contracts for installation of natural gas pipeline to move it from wells to distribution centers. And crude oil prices are now above $50 a barrel, so it's trending back up again. So I think that, if that continues, we're gonna see hardwood salt timber prices stay strong for some time. Combined with uh, a scarcity issue, there's not as much hardwood saw timber as there once was. Meanwhile, on the uh, other end of the spectrum, pulpwood and pine saw timber not doing as well. No, it's not. Uh, we've been waiting for residential construction for housing starts to get back up to the 1.5 million uh, seasonally adjusted annual rate volume of construction. We're somewhere around 1.2. Uh, it hasn't been growing as quickly as we'd like to see. So demand for pine saw timber to make lumber for construction purposes uh, it is not at the volume we need it to be and that's probably going to be the case for a few more years and you combine that with the fact that our inventories of standing pine saw timber in the state of Mississippi are very high. Well believe it or not a Boeing 737 flew 163 passengers from Seattle to Washington using jet fuel made from the limbs and branches left on the ground after a timber harvest. The Alaska Airlines flight was fueled with a 20% blend of sustainable aviation biofuel. That fuel is the first renewable alternative jet fuel made from forest residuals. The development was led by Washington State University. Back to our trivia quiz now to give you the answer. A botany lesson of sorts this week. Which one of the following is a droop? The answer is A, pecans. Even though it's the middle of winter, lots of homeowners are fantasizing about the beginning of spring. Why? Well, because it means they can work in the yard again and for many, plant a garden. For over a quarter century now, the Master Gardener Organization has been on the front line, helping extension offices answer the flood of questions that literally pour in when folks get out in the yard again. Master Gardeners are volunteers. They are trained and certified in all things related to home horticulture and they help extension agents disseminate research-based gardening information through a variety of activities that reach both young and old alike. Farm Week traveled recently to DeSoto County to meet a veteran Master Gardener volunteer who is more passionate than ever about serving and educating others. When I came, uh, I, one of the, the questions that they had on the application was uh, why do you want to be a master gardener? And I said, well, I've been digging in the dirt. I want to, I want to find out what I've been digging for. It was 15 years ago that Betty Pruitt signed up to become a master gardener volunteer in DeSoto County. Her only regret about that today is that she didn't do it sooner. Betty's mentor on this journey is Extension Service County Coordinator Joy Anderson. I would say that Betty's kind of unusual in that um, she's one of my success stories that uh, when she started the program and I told her, you know, there's the educational component, she flat out told me, I'll never speak in front of a group of people. And now you can't shut her up. 
Master Gardener volunteers like Betty Pruitt are the right hand of county agents when it comes to questions about home gardens. They are highly trained and help county extension offices reach a much broader audience with research proven horticulture information. Well, it allows me to do a whole lot more education in the county. Um, one person, it's really hard. We're in one of the largest counties population wide in the state. Um, I think the last figure the was 100. Growing, yeah, 167,000 people, and I'm one horticulture agent. And so in order for me to, to really make an impact, you have to have that volunteer base that's helping you get out in the community and, and doing horticulture programs so that people know how to take care of their home garden. And that frees me up to be able to do other things, like working with the commercial folks. We get to be able to see other people's gardens and and be able to interact with some other people in the community, which is great. And then when we do our library lecture series and people come, you know, you'll start off on one topic, but then the question period comes and it just goes off on all the different things. So sometimes a 20 minute talk may end up an hour and the people are still asking questions. That makes you feel so good when you do that. It's really great. Across the parking lot from the DeSoto County Extension Office is a garden where Betty Pruitt and other Master Gardener volunteers in the county receive their first hands-on training in horticulture. It's known here as the Learning Garden. Not every county is able to have a teaching resource like this. This garden is also a certified Monarch Butterfly way station. They've uh, planted a lot of butterfly weed. That's what this flower is over there that, uh, that you saw the, uh, the caterpillar on. Uh, up in the uh, up in the butterfly garden area, up in the woods, you'll go. You'll see some of the little um, the casings that the, that the uh, butterfly is going to emerge from. I was hoping maybe today that y'all would actually see see one emerge, but they're a little sleepy or tired or whatever, so maybe not. As with 4-H, you learn by doing. It's much better when they can get out here and actually do what needs to be done and see it being done than just giving them a piece of paper and saying, you know, read this and do this. Right. So it works a whole lot better. In exchange for 40 hours of training, each Master Gardener volunteer like Betty Pruitt is certified and volunteer to return 40 hours of service to their communities within one year. I know that the first year I was scared to death. How in the world am I going to get 40 hours in? and I got 104 in that year. So, and it sort of climbs up and down, you know, but usually somewhere around 100 hours a year. One of Betty Pruitt's first volunteer projects after being certified was being involved in a plant camp for children. She still looks forward to that event each year. We do a plant camp every year for, we keep it at 30 so that uh, we, can, we can corral them because sometimes they'll start out sort of shy on a Monday. By Wednesday, it's like herding cats. You gotta, you gotta sort of keep up with them. That's, that's the fun time when you see those kids learning and their eyes are brightening up. This year we had uh, a little boy that got to be a beekeeper. He put his suit on and got to do with the bees and things. I mean, those, yeah, those are, yes. That's, that's what makes a master gardener glad she's a master gardener. The volunteers are required to receive continuing education along the way. To remain certified in the program, master gardeners attend 12 hours of training and return 20 hours of volunteer service each year following their first one. For Betty, as you heard earlier, meeting the minimum has never been a problem. The opportunities to serve are many and also varied, and she enjoys every one of them. We have a Master Gardener hotline here that we man during the springtime. We've also, uh, on Saturdays, we go to Farmer's Market down there at uh, Hernando. And uh, we have, it's called Ask the Master Gardener, where we give out pamphlets, but people bring us all sorts of stuff. And sometimes, uh, Joy will say, oh, could you go out to such and such house uh, and, and check on this uh, garden problem that they've got. And so we'll go do that. And once I've got them trained, if I get a call and I think it's the right kind of call, I'll call them and say, I need you to go 
and see this person about their problem. And I explain to them what's going on and I make sure that they have the tools that they need to go out and do that home visit, whether it's publications or um, clippers to get samples so that we can send it off if they need to. Agents describe the Master Gardener Volunteer Program as a great way to gain horticulture expertise while meeting other avid gardeners and getting connected to the community. Volunteer Betty Pruitt doesn't see any downside, no matter your background, your age, or your education. Do you know, I don't think there's a person that wouldn't enjoy it once they got in. We've had people that were a little timid about going, coming into us saying, oh, well, I don't know anything about horticulture, so I can't do this. If you like to go out and pull weeds or look at flowers or dig in the dirt, it doesn't matter. We've got doctors, we've got lawyers, we've got school teachers, we've got little old people like me that's never done anything. That once you get into the Master Gardening Program, if you care about horticulture at all, or if you don't even know about horticulture, if you just care about gardening and flowers, I'd say jump in with both feet. You won't regret it. It'll, it'll be the best time of your life. From Hernando, Mississippi, I'm Leighton Spann reporting. And Troy, thanks to you for your help on that story. And there, there are more than 1,000 Master Gardener volunteers in the state like Betty Pruitt right now, and they do an incredible job of increasing Extension's capacity to meet this increasing public demand for horticulture information. Yeah, and would you believe it, 62 counties in Mississippi that have Master Gardener programs, a lot of the volunteer service has provided, uh, been provided the last 25 years, and you can contact your local county Extension office if you're interested in becoming a volunteer like Betty. All right, we thank you for joining us today for Farm Week. We'll see you next week.